I wouldn't say this on any public platform at this point because of how divisive it is. Peter Rosenberg is one of the top voices in New York City, where he hosts several programs for networks like Hot 97, ESPN, The Ringer, WWE, and Wondery. Would you be just as interested as becoming a professional broadcaster in this era as you did when you were coming up? Um, you know, I don't know. I always have thought of myself as a pretty confident person and I will look at the comments and actually feel bad. Man, maybe I am like mean. Maybe I am insecure. Israel, Palestine. Do you try to actively change people's opinions? Because obviously like, you believe yours is right and if you believe theirs is wrong. The challenge of who we are as human beings comes when the issue is directly related to you. How do you feel when your heartstrings were pulled out? And yet you believe now the answer is to continue to power through and kill more people. Why? Because of the pain and the anger and the hurt that you feel because of this horrible thing that we all witnessed. Is that really a legitimate justification for more and more and more death? So this podcast is mainly about self-improvement and getting better every day, getting the most out of your life. I would love to hear from you because you do so much and you are a man of so many interests across pro wrestling, hip hop, general sports, DJing. It's you are a modern day renaissance man. But I do wonder, because you have so many interests, do so many things, have so many commitments. Do you think that you're actually getting better, improving at your craft on a day to day basis or is your main goal every day just to survive, get through the day, get on air and not get fired? Um, that's an, that's a good question. And by the way, should anybody notice, cause I don't know, depending on how you cut your video that I'm randomly having sips of a Miller light. These are leftover Super Bowl beers and it's a Sunday and they've been sitting out on my kitchen counter and my wife like doesn't want to waste refrigerator space on beer because we don't really <laughs> drink beer. So yesterday I put them in. And so now I'm going to have a cold beer on a Sunday. So I, I don't want anyone to worry about me. Um, <laughs> so I would say that's, a, that's actually, I'm not saying this generically because a lot of times when people say that's a good question, it's a stall tactic. And sometimes they think it means it's actually not a good question. They just don't have a way to answer it. That was actually a really interesting question. Um, I would say I am improving as a broadcaster every day. However, my knowledge of all of the things that I work in does not get better every day. Mm. Uh, that, that is not, I, I, I'm sure there are some people that they just continue to get even more knowledgeable. I mean, you work with Ariel too. Like I, you know, he's, he's a freak and I would imagine, although maybe he would say even he knows less than he did 15 years ago. It's just that he was at such a psychotic starting point that you don't even notice it. I, I don't know but I'm guessing he's someone who like doesn't lose any, but like for me, I don't know as much about hip hop now as I have at points. I don't know as much about wrestling as I have at points. I don't know as much about sports as I have at points. That is all true based on the amount of work that I do. And also the fact that i still do prioritize rest and fun. Mm. So I don't, necessarily then spend all of my time when I'm not working boning up on every single thing. Um, and sometimes I feel bad about that. And then sometimes I say, that's just sort of the natural order of things to some degree that by the time you get really good at the craft of performing, you no longer have what was your initial skill set which was that you were the person who knew everything. Right. So that was my original way I got into everything. I was the hip hop guy because I knew everything. And then once I started becoming a real performer myself all the time, slowly you start to become more of a performer and less of an expert. Right. I think a great example of that and people kill him for it. And I, I just relate to it um, on, on, on some level is Stephen A. Stephen A gets crushed for not knowing things. 
but he's a full blown entertainer now. Like he's the knowledge part is a piece of it. And granted, I I don't have an interest or aspiration to going all the way to the side of entertainment that Stephen A is on where like he really doesn't have like necessarily super nerdy, you know, deep conversations on a subject. He has only sort of entertaining, fun, peripheral conversations. I don't necessarily aspire to do that. However, it's worked incredibly well for him. He's incredibly good at it. He is the biggest sports personality in the world. And the idea of being like, how did you not know who that bench player was for Utah? It's like, dude, that's who he was. That's how he got the chance. He can't possibly do it now. Um, so I, I relate to it. And at the same time, you feel bad because I'm like, oh, I mean, I, I want to still be the guy who knows everything that's happening in hip hop. I, I do if it's hip hop from 1996, but from 2024, <laughs> when like I'm busy living this adult life and doing all this work, I don't know, man, that's hard. It, that That's really impressive. The people who continue to know everything about like the current stuff while super active, God bless them. I, I just, I don't know that I have that skill set. There's a big between very successful people. Um, there's kind of like this push and pull about the, the word balance. And some people will say you need to have balance in your life. You absolutely cannot think about work and, and work all the time. That's very unhealthy. But then on the other hand, you have people who to the outside world do not appear to have a balanced life from the outside. Looking in anyone who sees your resume, Peter would be like, Oh, that man is working all the time. He has no time for his wife and dogs and to enjoy the New York city lifestyle uh, that he's a part of. I want to get your thoughts on balance because I think if you don't really like your job, if you don't like what you're doing, if you're just trying to get a paycheck and put food on the table, like, yes, you need balance because you're going to hate your life. If you're obsessing over that thing. But if you genuinely love what you do, like you love broadcasting, obviously you love broadcasting. You touch in all these different facets. I think that's pretty cool if you're working all the time doing the thing that you love. That doesn't feel like a problem to me, but society kind of is pushing on it. Like, yeah, if you're obsessed with what you do, that's a problem. Yeah, that, it, it, that's that's true. I mean, and, you know, there are people, you and I have a, have mutual friends who I would say struggle with work-life balance because while they enjoy aspects of their job, the general job is sort of a nightmare. Yeah. So they're not able to be happy all the time. I would say on a given week, yeah, I don't feel overwhelmed at all. I, don't, I mean, I have, da- I have days where I'm more tired than others. The only days that are like, oh, are when other things like get added. So right. like if I have a day where like between my two shows, I have a doctor's appointment a business call, you know, I have like all these things that stack the whole day. And then at the end of the day, it's like, well, we have to go out to X, Y, then I will feel stretched to the limit. But on a given Tuesday, we're like, I wake up, I do my morning show. I record cheap heat with you at 11. I finish up at noon. I maybe get on the bike. I go to work at two. I get home at six 30. I don't feel overwhelmed at all. I feel like I have kind of a nine to five ish day. Like maybe it's a little bit longer, but also I have middle hours of the day when I'm not working and I'm with my wife and dogs and having a nice time. So I don't feel a a major like lack of balance in my life because I do enjoy it. I mean, if I was doing a, a, a show where I really wasn't interested in the subject matter, then it would, it would feel more like work. And I will say the the only place that that can ever happen is on my sports show. There can be days like in the middle of summer yeah. when like it's just baseball. So those days can feel like this is kind of work. Like I'm manufacturing topics that I don't right. really feel passionate about, but that's few and far between. And I can, I can make my way through those two. So, you know, yeah, it, it is true that if you really have a gig, that's fun. Finding the balance is, is obviously easier. Is there anything whether it's broadcasting or just in your general life overall, is there some flaw that you have, something that that eats away at you, that that irks you, something that you would like to change, something that you would like to improve upon? With regard to my work or life in general? Anything, anything. 
like, oh, I mean, yeah, I have lots of, I have lots of stuff that I want to work on. I, um, I would say the tops of the list. I always, I always want to be physically healthier. I always want to be working out more than I am. You know, there are, there are times when I'm just like too tired and have a bad week where I just don't work out like literally, you know, a full week where it's like, I didn't do really anything. Um, I don't love when that happens. Um, my, and that goes with like my sort of weight and eating habits as well. Like my weight has always been a thing my whole life. I have to sort of be putting in some, some significant level of effort to just stay like, okay. And even that is like, not like to have a great body. It's to have like a passable, be able to <laughs> get fit into my clothes and get on TV and right. not look totally bad. Um, so finding a rhythm with that is something I'm perpetually working on. Um, I would say working on my timeliness, you know, when it comes for work, I generally, I'm, I'm generally, especially in the earlier part of my day running late. I don't like that yet. It's a quality I've always had. Um, <laughs> you know, I've had, I've had many discussions about it. Like there, there's, you know, some people view, some people view like being late as like the single most offensive thing a human being can do. I of course don't see it that way <laughs> for, for whether it's happening to me or I'm doing it to someone else. I sort of, uh, but at the same time, since I know many people do view it that way, I obviously want to work on it. Um, but like my morning show, for example, that has literally been hard for me. I'm in like my 17th year of it and it will <laughs> never be easy Getting out of bed to be somewhere to work, I think, is just a hard thing for me. It was hard for me in school as a kid. Maybe it ties to some deep, like, deeper mental thing. I don't know. So anyways, that, I'd like to work on that. Um, also, in these days, distraction. You mm -hmm. know, like, my phone. That's a per I hate my phone habit. I, I'm on it way too much. I get very little joy from it. It's prob I think it's my worst addiction. I mean... I would say that food and that are probably my two worst addictions. You know, where like I can be like, oh, it's just, at a certain point, I just need it. Yeah. Right. Like at a certain point after X amount of days, I'm having a good meal. Like it's happening. Yeah. There's no, I'm not like Troy where I can go like <laughs> weeks on end with eating chicken breast and broccoli. Like oh, I yeah. am, I get through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like Thursday. It's like, all right, I'm gonna have a good dinner tonight. I, I, I did a good three days there of nothing but healthy. Let's go. <laughs> um, and it's sort of the same thing with my phone. It's like, oh, it's been two hours. Like I'm obviously going to pick up my phone and scroll through yeah. it now for the, di here's the big difference though. The food thing does for me have a legitimate payoff. Like I truly do enjoy, you know, Natalie and I went out for Italian last night. I truly enjoyed every bit of the meal. Like I, I, I had wine, we had calamari, a pasta dish, some eggplant, like all of it was some delightful. Carpaccio, <laughs> tartare. <laughs> some tar carpaccio, tartare, truffle, carpaccio, tartare. <laughs> no, all of the things we had, I thoroughly enjoyed. I literally take a moment and I will, I will out loud. Mm, this is, I am enjoying this. I never have that feeling with my phone. Mm. Almost never. Like, out of every hundred looks at my phone, there'll be a handful of things that I'm like, oh, that's nice. I'd like to show this to someone else. But 95, the other 95, it ain't, it ain't shit. There is nothing there for me. Yeah. It stimulates the same part of the, <laughs> the brain that drugs like cocaine do. It feels good for a moment, but then afterwards you often feel worse on the back end than you did entering the into front it. End it's not is, great. I've never done cocaine, but the front end of, of what I've heard that that beginning of cocaine seems much better than when you open up your phone. Like I don't know, you clearly haven't seen any frog videos recently. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me feel pretty good. <laughs> That's a good point. Bad uh, algorithm by me. Yeah. What I mean, you're pretty outspoken on social media, especially on X. It's definitely a place that you like to to air your thoughts and grievances. And as a, a talking head in media, that's you know, like partly your responsibility. No one faults you for that. Um so kind of like, what is your relationship with, uh, with posting on, on these platforms? Unhealthy. I, I mean, like I, I feel the, I feel the need to do it. Sometimes I rarely get the reaction that I want. Mm. I do you regret I mean, some things when you post them? I, I regret things that I post. Uh, mo this is only almost exclusively X. I mean, 
Instagram, I don't put up Instagram posts really that I regret. I mean, every once in a while, like I'll post a clip of a, from something and like the way people react to it will make me regret it. I'm like, oh, I didn't, like I put up a clip recently that was cut up. Uh, I do, I do a podcast um, with Michelle Beadle for Wondery and the, you know, they cut up, they want clips that'll get a little traction. So the clip was us kind of like uh, somewhat trashing Trevor Noah's hosting of the Grammys. And like, it's not a big deal. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about this. Like it's, I'm not, it's like, you know, something that crossed your mind. Someone hosting a show is it's something as if you're interested in entertainment, it's the kind of thing you review. what do you right. think? I thought they were good. I thought they were bad. I thought they were funny. We didn't like it. I, I, Trevor Noah has always been sort of interesting to me and that people think he's so great and I don't quite get it. Right. And I, being a radio host, I have these takes and I talk about them and I have lots of theories on why I could go into all sorts of depth on it, but I never think about it in terms of presenting it as a quick clip for people who are not listening overall to consume. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that it ends up rubbing people then can be in a way that I wish I didn't even put it up. Yeah. You seem so bitter. This is so mean. You're just a hater. But And it's like, well, you know what Trevor Noah would be doing if he wasn't hosting the Grammys? He, he also would have been talking about whoever was hosting the Grammys. Like, this isn't an unusual thing. This is people who are outward personalities talk about culture. They analyze things. Yeah. It's, I don't think I said anything that went beyond the pale of offensive. I don't even think I, I didn't call up untalented or unfunny as a person. I just was like, this did not work for me. You know, I did not get it. And, and then I'll look at the comments and they will, you know, I've, I always have thought of myself as a pretty confident person and I will look at the comments and actually feel bad, Mm. like feel beat up by the, I'm like, man, maybe I am like, mean. Maybe I am insecure. Maybe I am jealous. Maybe I am a hater. Like I wish I could sit here and tell you, I don't give a fuck what the comments say. I will. I just, it means nothing for me. That's a lie. I think for Uh, most people it is too. For most people, it's a lie. 99% of people. It's a lie. I've seen it with the most talented rappers, the most talented wrestlers, athletes, people care. And it sucks that we care because the amount of thought put into the comment is so much less significant than the amount of pain that it can cause. Mm. So like one person who just posts like, yo, you're such a fucking hater, Rosenberg. They don't even think about it. In fact, I don't even know what their angle is. They may be totally joking. They may love me and think like, oh, Rosenberg, why are you always hating on something? That's not the voice I hear. I hear you're such a hater. Oh, you made me sick. Your mom should be ashamed. That, that's like what I hear. And so those things make me regret. Um, also, sometimes like trying to speak about a political issue in a nuanced way on X, you know, is is obviously hard because right. why wouldn't it be? And or, or even giving an opinion that's not necessarily political in nature, but is just a strong opinion on something it can lead to a reaction that's like, you know, again, just brings out feelings you weren't hoping to get into. And, and so I I do have some, I do have some regrets uh, about the things that I post. And I, again, I don't know what I'm hoping for. Like (laughs) I, I rarely get a viral tweet, you know, and that's really the most satisfying thing you can hope to have happen is that you put up a tweet and it goes viral. Like it gets thousands of retweets and, and, and likes and all those things that rarely happens. So what are you really getting out of it? Like a hundred people liked it and 22 people commented back to you and 45 retweeted it. And your life is no different, but like you are rating yourself. I am rating how influential I am. Every time I open up my stupid social media platforms, I see the number of followers and it, you know, particularly Instagram, for example, it'll like, I don't, my Twitter literally has not changed for maybe five years. 
I have sat at the same amount of followers, right around 350,000 or something for legit five years. So that in itself is kind of a reminder, like, wow, I I don't grow. (laughs) My brand cannot grow. I am just as successful now as I was five years ago. My, my bank account could say otherwise my, you know, there are a bunch of other metrics I could use to say, oh, I, I have grown. But that one metric is telling me you're just the same. And and in the case of like Instagram, uh, it goes through ebbs and flows. The account will grow. And I'm like, oh, this is worthwhile. This is why I put time into it because I'm seeing it grow. And then it'll just dead stop. Like it recently stopped. I went on a growth period from uh, like late spring last year, like before I got married my through really my wedding was like a big catapult of growth for some reason. Got the rub from Miss Hatton. Yeah. Yeah. The big Miss Hatton rub, although hers, di- hers went down. <laughs> so, um, and, and then it went on like a steady grow, a steady growth for months. And I, I tried to do better content. I had someone helping like produce some better looking videos just stopped. Cannot grow. Literally like last week it went down a number. It went down a thousand. Like, do you do? I don't even post anything political that you think would make me lose followers, you know? Um, but I, a couple of weeks ago, I posted a random picture of Beyonce just because I love her new song. And I'm like, who doesn't want to see a hot image of Beyonce? And here's lost followers. Cause people are either don't like beautiful people or <laughs> Beyonce or black people or women, or I don't know. But like, it seemed like the safest thing to post ever. Right. To me. That and Taylor Swift, you can't go wrong. <laughs> right, like what's the, oh no, both of those now will lead to people be like, unfollow, especially Taylor. I mean, she's like a, she's like a, a rocket now for controversy. Not on the social media growth aspect, but more so like managing social media relationship. Now to a much, much lesser extent, obviously I have nowhere near the the following that you do. But after I posted my uh, infamous January 1st video that we uh, don't need to talk about here. I said some things I regretted, had to get some words off my chest in the heat of the moment, often like you do on social. And I got such unanticipated blowback to that, that it really made me sit back and think and kind of like, why am I posting things? Why am I saying things? What am I looking for? What am I trying to achieve? And oftentimes it all like led back to ego. I want to feel better mm-hmm. about myself. I'm in a bad state. Let's get some, let's get some cheap dopamine rushes just to make this moment feel better. And so since then I, I've kind of revised my strategy where like I have I have a post, something I want to say. But if I in any way feel that one person might not like this. Or if I'm unsure about it anyway, I just save it as a draft and I give it 24 hours and I come back to it the next day and ask myself, okay, do I still feel strongly about getting this out to the world? And if my answer is no, I don't put it out. So I don't know if that would work for you or not, but I, I think it's a really, really good policy. Um, I think it depends. It, it would work in some ways, but in other ways, you know, part of the point, I guess, is you're trying to like, be in a moment. Yeah. So if you miss the moment, is it right? Like if it's, you're talking about the super bowl during the super bowl, obviously but like, doesn't but like, apply. What's but. The, but, what, but what is the fucking point of all of it? Like I seriously, try, if you were to try to explain to an alien, <laughs> why you need to post a tweet to connect. Okay. But like, what did, we, okay. So when, one of the most memorable fights of my life, it was Diego Corrales versus Jose Luis Castilla what did I do? Like, did I call, Hey dad, I, I, you know, my dad doesn't really care about sports, but dad, you got to see this round. This is amazing. Or did I call my friend Indy and say, dude, are you watching this fight? Maybe. Or maybe I waited till I saw friends the next time, the next day and said, Oh, what'd you do last night? Oh man, I did blah, blah, blah. <laughs> or in my case, cause I was always desperate to, to tell my words. The next time I did a college radio show, I'd get on the radio and tell a little bit. But like, there was a time when my need to share all of these thoughts was unique. And because of that, I pursued a career in talking. But most of the people that I knew did not. 
They did not feel this need to communicate everything they felt. So if you were Peter Rosenberg, 22 years old today and wanted to be a professional broadcaster um, in this era, would you be just as interested as becoming a professional broadcaster in this era as you did when you were coming up 20 years ago? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It does not seem as cool. I will say that it's, it's, it's everyone has a platform for a voice. So even if you get to a really major platform, it doesn't mean the same thing because everyone has some sort of platform. Um, that's a, that's a good question also. And then, and then there's a, the window is getting less and less for commentators, like people like myself, passionate people who love a, a specific field wanted to work our tail off so we could get the right to talk about X field from like an educated standpoint, but an, an educated outsider. Yeah. That is becoming like less and less a thing. Yeah. Whether it's, whether it's, you know, hip hop being dominated by podcasters who are former rappers to the sports world being dominated by podcasts that are former athletes. Like everywhere you look, it's not people who were just broadcasting on the subject, you know? And, and I, I guess I have a certain resentment about that probably, you know, you know, Ariel Helwani and I are, are similar in the sense that we were outsiders of a field who were like, we're just going to like work our tail off being into it to earn our way into having a voice. And that is becoming basically impossible. Right. You know, but then on the flip side, you can also find all kinds of fame. If you're just like a random kid who posts videos of a certain type and yeah. they do well, and you have no discernible skill, no knowledge base of anything. You just like it happens to connect in the right way. Yeah. You could make millions and millions of dollars just being you, you know, like uh, my TikTok algorithm will show me like this one kid who speaks about Palestine and Israel. His engagement is absolutely psychosis. Like it's he he has so much engagement, which is another extra sick element about sort of political uh, yeah. content because like it just garners views. Right? Oh yeah. So you can really boost your career off of a war, but um, <laughs> this kid is legitimately 18 years old and speaking matter of factly about like hardcore, serious geopolitical issues that like you just fundamentally cannot have the knowledge base for it. You can't, like you can have some knowledge base for it, but like you're talking about every video is in the hundreds of thousands or millions of views. And you have been following the crisis in the Middle East for all of six months. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. It's, it's so I, all of these, this long windedness that I'm adding here is to say, I don't know whether this is what would have interested me, you know, or maybe I would have went straight into when I made that decision to be a commentator, like in the way that I am versus like, I'm going to try to pursue play by play. Maybe I would have pursued just doing play by play. Maybe that would have been, cause that will always be needed in some way. Although those jobs are fewer and far between too, because it used to be, you have a play by play and a color analyst. And sometimes the color anal analyst is an ex athlete. Now the color analyst is always an ex-athlete. So it's just the play-by-play -play job in every situation where you can get away with not being a former athlete. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. Do you think that content creators or podcasters or whoever have a, a social responsibility? And here, here's what I mean. And like the most famous example that comes to my mind is Joe Rogan, for example, most famous podcast in the world, biggest listenership, bigger than CNN. 
he came under fire during COVID for having people on uh, like well-respected doctors and people with many published papers, basically saying that the vaccine is stupid or you shouldn't take it, whatever. And then there was all sorts of like cancel Joe Rogan and Sp- and Spotify came under fire for allowing Rogan to continue doing the podcast, spreading, you know, misinformation about the, the vaccine. My kind of <clears throat> defense of Rogan was, well, he's not a doctor. He's, he's just a person asking questions. Like people are just saying things. It's not his responsibility to fact check them. Like he's just asking questions. If you're going to the Joe Rogan experience as a listener for your medical advice, like that's, that's on you. It's not his responsibility to do that. So I'm I'm saying like, do you think people who are not CNN, who are not like legitimized organizations like that have a responsibility to do right by the public all of the time? Um, Hmm. No, no, I don't think they fundamentally have a built-in. Um, so th- the thinking is like, if you have that many people consuming you, it is your duty to inform the people with the absolute best, most accurate, scientifically right. backed information. It just becomes a blurry line. So, so no, you, you don't fundamentally have an obligation to do a news information program. However, I suppose... Like, for example, if the way Joe Rogan wanted to have wanted to cover COVID was doing jokes about it and everything was sort of funny and a goof and people were offended by it because they said, this is a very serious thing and you're making jokes. My response would be, well, yeah, but he's just making jokes. That's his form of entertainment. If you're not interested, don't listen. Once you decide to go down the path of serious conversation, to a large audience. I do think you have some level of obligation to really make sure you're doing it in a way that is researched, smart, balanced, etc. Because you don't have any obligation to go there. But if you if it becomes your thing that you're like I'm going to be disease guy then you better make sure you're speaking to a wide range of people with, you know, varying sort of backing and uh, quote unquote agendas and, and see what you get. Now, I, I don't know anything about the way that Rogan, for example, handled his COVID research. Like I know, I'm sure at some point he spoke to really credible people And then Mm -hmm. at other points, he spoke to less credible people and people then really focused on the less credible people and spent, you know, less time focused on the more credible people. I, I, that seems like a logical thing that not a logical thing. That seems like the likely way that things would happen in 2024. Um, But he's also particularly unique because like, I don't know. He 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 actually confuses me too. I, I find him to be a really interesting person because yeah. he he's a lot like CNN to me. It's funny that you brought them both up. He is like CNN to me, and here's why. When Donald Trump became president, CNN to me was, while a flawed news outlet, it was to me, as a progressive a good place to watch the news because I don't need to watch MSNBC because I already, I could just listen to my family talk at the dinner table (laughs) and I don't want to watch Fox news because I just don't need to hear idiots talk. So I would go to CNN where I'd be like, you know what? This is pretty much like, it's not MSNBC, but it's also definitely not Fox news. I'll, I'll go to CNN and just kind of hear what the news story is. Donald Trump gets elected and immediately starts making CNN, not MSNBC. (laughs) He makes CNN his like, you're fake news. We hate CNN. They're fake news. And CNN then, if you go back, I swear I watched it happen. They literally became who he said they were. 
he, mm-hmm. they then in an effort to almost fight back became very much an anti-Trump network. And every time I turn them on, now granted, he made it very easy for any respectable news outlet to seem like an anti-Trump network because he was doing crazy things. But beyond that, there was a little more edge to it. Like they were really playing nemesis to Trump. And as a result, it worked perfectly for him. They played right into his hand. So if you did go on CNN and you're a Trump person, you're like, oh my God, they're exactly what he says they are. I feel that Rogan sort of did the same thing. I felt that Rogan got a a sort of false rap for being kind of like on the right. Yeah. When I was like, I don't really, I'm not a Rogan fan, but I admire his ascent in journalism as someone who created his own show and then got to be the color commentator in the sport that he loves. Kind of exactly what I like to do. Like, yeah, respect. Um, I never found him to be particularly funny, but I always found him to be like a good talker and interesting enough. The COVID subject got so many people to go anti Rogan yeah, and to assume that because he was anti COVID, he was also like a right winger that then he started leaning into this obsession with anti cancel culture (laughs) <laughs> and he ended up seeming like the right winger that people decided that he was. Right. And then he started saying other things that I'd be like, he said that. Uh, and I was like, I really consciously thought I'm like, I don't think he would have said that a few years ago. I think he's ended up getting pushed over by people who have opposed him. And it's by the way, in both cases, it's sort of a natural thing that happens, right? Like you end up under the ire of somebody, you defend yourself against that before you know it, you're pitted against them. But yeah, I found that both of them kind of went opposite directions um, in ways that maybe they wouldn't have had people not said the things that they said. I didn't used to be offended by Rogan, but th- with, with very few exception. I mean, there, he, he has a few, he has a few moments in his history that if he were, you know, not as powerful as he was, we probably would have never heard from him again. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but by and large, I never found myself getting offended by him. But I, I, I have found over the last couple of years that he said a thing or two, whether it be about Biden or about other big political issues that I was kind of like, eh, hmm. I didn't really think he was that kind of guy. Yeah. I, um, I'm not a huge Rogan fan either. I do tune in from time to time, especially when he has Aaron Rodgers on, because that's just... <laughs> Fascinating. That's just, that's just fascinating theater. But I will say my my you know, and this is just kind of represent representative of just how people consume media now is is through headlines, through sixty second bites. I mean, these are three hour podcasts that he's doing. People aren't hearing the depths of the conversation; they're just running with whatever the headline is, and then like, oh, Joe Rogan's the far right guy. Um, and a lot of the like. His pod, he did a podcast with Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who I believe is like CNN's doctor, and they were diametrically opposed COVID views. And they just had the absolute best podcast conversation I've ever had, where you had two diametrically opposed people having a nuanced conversation about a very difficult subject in such a sophisticated way, respectful way, with respect for seeing the other person's viewpoint, saying like, Hey, I agree with you here. I see where you're coming from here, but let me push back here. And it was just three hours of that. And it was so inspiring to me to see in this era of polarization of where just talking louder (laughs) over the other person to try to get people to convince you, which psychology just doesn't work. You get more defensive and more angry. Yeah. I wish that was, I, you know, I'll link that podcast in the show notes to listen back to just like, this is how you have a disagreement. This is a great way to have a disagreement. I wish we could all disagree like this. Yeah. The, the, and by the way, it's so funny. Like I, I, I used to have those. And I do think this is an important piece though. People don't like to acknowledge this because it's a political line to draw. And I wouldn't say this probably on my, on any public platform at this point because of how divisive it is. But there's a, the fact of the matter is, We used to, in this country, up until very recently, be able to have pretty hardcore political debates without it being intense, okay? My ex-father-in-law was a traditional sort of Reagan-like Republican. 
That is not me at all. Not my family at all. And yet we never had a problem. We would have conversations, disagreements, some laughs. All right, what's for dinner? (laughs) Right? We all know when that changed. Yeah. And that's the part that's fundamentally tough is that no one, you're considered like a wacky Trump hater leftist if you point out the truth, which is that up until the Trump I don't know if it's candidacy or, or, or probably an election, him winning. But basically up until 2016, even through the Tea Party in which there was stuff that was, and don't get me wrong, like I've always had some groups that it's like, it's impossible to, to me, arguing with the pro-gun nut is very yeah. hard. Like there are yeah. some that are just <laughs> very hard. You're if a, an absolute staunch pro-lifer who like cannot, um, who doesn't even believe in abortion in the cases of rape and incest. Like there are certain people that are just impossible to argue with, but on most political issues, you could do it up until Trump, because the fact of the matter is, and this is where it gets really complex for people. Trump represents something much deeper than political ideology. And because of that, and because those who are aware to it, know that there's a much deeper racial social component. Everything has changed. Everything has changed because now if you come out and say, I love what Donald Trump stands for. It is very hard for anyone to hear that and think, well, wait, what does that include? What do you mean exactly? Because I can look at this policy or this moment or when he said this or when he said that or this person in his cabinet, or that person, all of those things connote something that goes way beyond a political conversation. It's much more social. It's much more human. It's much more hateful in some cases. And as a result, we now have a, 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 a passion and a fervor that we're, we're incredibly divided. That doesn't mean that racism was not bad or rampant prior to Donald Trump. It was. But there was a clear direction this country was going. Whether racism was still bad or not, we work slowly over time saying racism was bad. We are going to move in a new direction where we know it is it is the scourge of this planet. It is the most disgusting part of our country's history, and we are going to take steps for it to be less and less. More and more people will mix races, but through romantic relationships, we will have more people who are mixed race human beings like we are getting away from that. And I feel that over the last few years, there's been a major kickback where the last people who really like racism and really wanted it to stick around are fighting hard to keep it. Yeah. And those who are going the other way are fighting really hard to kill it. And so there's a really deep thing that's in there that ultimately is at the core of all these conversations. And and it even relates to stuff like the COVID thing. You know, which is kind of crazy because, I mean, Trump got the vaccine. Trump, Operation Warp Speed, he did the vaccine. (laughs) You know, like it was so, but his people were often anti-vaccine. So like it just (laughs) convolutes every sort of conversation. Forget about trying to convince the nuts on social media, you know, that they can't be convinced. It's no use trying to change their minds. But the people in your life, people in your circle that you're close with or have some type of relationship with, do you think it's worth trying to convince them to what you believe, you know, like your point of view, which is what you believe to be, be right? Like you're a proud, you're, you're a proud Jew, obviously, Israel, Palestine. Like I'm sure there's a lot of people in your life who are anti-Israel. There certainly are in mine. And with a lot of like divisive issues, I, I just kind of resigned to the fact a couple years ago, people can't be changed. You are who you are. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to get worked up trying to change your opinion. It's not worth it to me. But what, like, do you try to actively change people's opinions? Because obviously like, you believe yours is right. And if you believe theirs is wrong. Mm, yeah, it depends on the subject, you know? Um, but I'd say these days, no, I don't often try. The only, the only time where I will, if someone's outwardly speaking things that I think are stupid and they're trying to share it, then I may reach out and say like, Hey, what's going on here? This doesn't, this is not it, you know, but otherwise 
I, I don't know that I feel it's it's useful to. And the issue you just brought up, for example, specifically, Israel Palestine is in, super complicated for oh, Jews yeah. because people feel so strongly in different directions, and uh, it's like it's just an impossible conversation. Yeah. So, like, I. I really only feel comfortable, like, I swear to you, like in my home, like on this issue. I mean, because I am ardently against the war. I I mean, I, I'm ardently against all war. That goes back to being a dumb, a dumb 17 year old, but I was right. I agree with my dumb 17 year old self. Like, <laughs> I, I was, I've always been against wars Post 9-11, I was against wars. And post October 7th, I'm against wars. I just don't, I just don't think it works. And, and, and it's funny because like if you base like, it's like the one subject where research doesn't matter. Because I'm like, I could like lay, like I could say, hey, let me know the last time, when was the last <laughs> time a situation like this worked out the way you wanted it to? And like invariably. <laughs> That's such a good point. <laughs> invariably, you end up in like this, well, what about the call? What about the Holocaust? And I'm like, okay, if you want to go to the Holocaust, yeah, I, I'm very, I am, I am glad that uh, the United States intervened eventually, right? Like the, there are certain circumstances that are so horrible that, yeah, of course, I, I don't know that I, I don't know, like, listen, I do know if there are places in Europe that peacefully resisted the Holocaust or, and tried to, um, with with varying degrees of n- not success. Um, so yes, obviously, of course, as a, as a, as a son of a, a mother who was born in a displaced persons camp and much of her family was killed. Yes. I I'm, I'm grateful that Hitler was stopped, but if that's the first thing you can go to, and there have been so many wars between then and now, and none of them, none of the ones we're talking about quite mirror that situation that's probably a rough argument. Like you're, you're <laughs> probably not doing well in the argument. Right. So I, well, here's what, let me try to say this. I, actually, I'm excited to have this platform because your podcast is small enough that yeah. some people will hear this. This won't get out, but most people won't hear this. Yeah. But if you know what they do, it's my, it's my feelings. And <laughs> I'll, I feel you're giving me space to say it in a way where that's calm and rational. The challenge of who we are as human beings comes when the issue is directly related to you. So if you are a fellow Jewish person, for example, and you are pointing out all these other issues in which you say, this country is an aggressor. They shouldn't do that to those people. It's not right. That's really nice. And I think very often Jewish folks in this country are on the right side of those issues. But it's much more powerful and impactful to see how do you feel when your heartstrings were pulled out. On October 7th, you witnessed people of your faith brutally attacked. People in a country that we have been raised as American Jews to have at least some level of fondness or affinity for. We watch people of that country senselessly attacked. Now we're sitting here months later. And after those 1200 people were brutally killed, we have now witnessed 30,000 people were close to it killed in response to that. Last time I checked, zero of those 1,200 have come back to life. The hostages that are there still remain. The person who was in charge of protecting the country, who by any measure failed, is leading this war. And yet... You very often believe now the answer is to continue to power through and kill more people. Why? Because of the pain and the anger 
and the hurt that you feel because of this horrible thing that we all witnessed. Is that really a legitimate justification for more and more and more death? And what is the end result going to be? Now, do I feel triggered when I see people who are ardently anti-Israel, who don't understand the history at all of Israel, make it sound as if it's criminal to believe in an Israeli state? who, God forbid, make it sound as if October 7th was justified, who make it sound as if Hamas is a legitimate political group. All of those things sicken me and anger me. But I'm not Joe Rogan or CNN, and I'm not going to allow people who disagree with me and anger me I'm not going to allow them to shift the way I view a situation, which is clear. It is clear that this war has to end. Like that is a clear, I, and if I have to convince you of why children shouldn't be getting bombed and why turning a place into a parking lot is not going to be safe, not only for Palestinians, obviously, but not going to be safe for future Jews. If, if I can't convince you of that, I don't know what there is for me to say to you. And if, I, and if I say to you, point out to me the example post-World War II where this worked out really well. And in the long run, what we got was a safe, secure situation, a d- democratic government, all worked out. I'll wait. You won't have an answer. And so then you're going to explain to me, oh, so the... Israel now is going to permanently rule Gaza and the West Bank. All of these things are not going to be healthy for Israelis. And and then honestly, as an American Jew, what I resent is it's not going to be safe for me and my future children. We're, We're all going to be in more danger because of this situation. Does any of that make October 7th justified or okay? Absolutely not. But I just don't understand what the win here is. So that was an incredibly long-winded way of saying, that's how I feel. I don't think I'm capable of calmly expressing that to people (laughs) in conversation the way I just did to you. And they'll be, and yet, if they were there, they won't have anything to offer in the conversation that I know can really change my viewpoint because I don't believe in war don't believe in killing people. I don't believe in violence as a way to solve problems. I love watching two people fight for a lot of money in an octagon or a boxing ring. I even love fake versions of that even more, but Uh, I said the F word. Oh boy. I know. Sorry. Sorry. I have pretend versions of it even more, but, um, I don't believe it. I don't believe in it as a fundamental system. I don't believe in two people getting a fist fight to solve a problem. I don't believe in a bomb being dropped to solve a problem. And for people like, Troy, it's scary. Like there are people yeah. who, even when you tell them right now, like, yeah, but babies are dying. They're like, so, you know, like I lost a friend this week who ironically, the reason I didn't talk to him in the last few months is, is because he had a disagreement with myself and some other friends about this issue. Really? He was a wonderful peace loving progressive man, but he was like October 7th sent him into his own, Right. We hadn't spoken. Now, we also hadn't had a big fight, but we hadn't spoken. And he died this week. He was 42. He was an amazing guy. It has been a gut-wrenching week. I've watched a community, like, shattered by his being gone. Do people believe that the, the people who die in Gaza don't have people who cry for them and mourn them? They think like they're just like a race of people who are born like, kill Jew, kill Jew, kill Jew. They're not humans. Because I can tell you that like everyone who dies is a, is a human being with like a mother and a brother and a sister and a family and and people are crushed by all of it. Um, back in the day, my dad just told me this the other day, back in the day in this country, in like the Civil War, when like tons of Americans were dying, Right. Like there's this war where like many, many people are dying. You you would like, you might think that back then people didn't even like care. Like they were just used to it. Like, oh, well, 
you have two kids. One's probably dying in war. Right. Like people aren't okay just because death is happening. And back in those days, the mothers of a lot of those kids, because we didn't know anything about like depression or, you know, pain or recovery, the women, the, those mothers who suffered through those deaths, they'd often then for years just be called like the crazy lady. People mm. were just like, that's a crazy lady. <laughs> you know, the, she's crazy. She's always angry all the time. It's like, oh, the, the one whose two sons were killed in a war? Who yeah. no one's ever talked to her about it? Like, as they're not worried about her well being, she's now the crazy lady. So, like, I say that to say, we mourn in this country, we mourn death like it's it's super impactful and you see people hurt. And yet when we talk about a war where near, nearly 30,000 people have died, we just talk as if it's a number and there's no one hurting. You know, like we saw the families hurting in Israel after October 7th. I mean, I, I did. You don't think that Palestinian families hurt in the same way? Or like it's okay that they hurt because there were really horrible Palestinians who committed October 7th. So that makes it okay now that a mother of someone else who has nothing to do with those people, they should suffer pain. I just, I just, I try, I just don't get it. And so because of that, I do not have these conversations. And like invariably, someone will probably listen to this who knows me and be angry at me, even though all that I have said throughout this conversation is that like war is bad and kids dying is bad. <laughs> and yet there'll be like some anger in there. And I think we're all very sensitive and, you know, Jews do have a lot of reason to be sensitive, but um, we're not the only people who have a right to be sensitive to stuff. A lot of people have had trauma. Well, thank you for uh, sharing all of that. Um, and I'm so sorry that you lost your friend. That actually brings up something that uh, I feel very passionately about and is why I really don't uh, engage in like any kind of verbal combat with anyone, people in my life especially, because I... I lost a friend, a close friend uh, early on in my life. And we, toward the end of her life, we had a squabble and like we never repaired it. And then she just was killed one day. And I never got to repair that with her. And so I've had to live with that for the rest of my life that we had this silly little argument that I never got to tell her one more time how much I loved her. And so I'm wondering, and I'm not saying like you and your friend were having a silly argument, but you were not not you a little distance because of this thing that you disagreed on. And now he's no longer with us. Does that eat at you at all that you were in kind of a, a rough spot and now he's gone and you don't get to tell yeah. him how, one more time how awesome he is. Yeah, it does. It's, it's just more reason that I hate this war. It's just like, you know, listen, I, I had reached out to him. It's not like I, I wasn't mad. I wasn't offended by his, wrong take on this issue. <laughs> I wasn't offended by it. Uh, and I don't think he was offended by me, but the fact that the reason we didn't speak anymore was because of this geopolitical thing that neither of us can control anyway. Just, yeah, it's, it's just another reason to hate this shit. Yeah. Like we can't do anything, man. Like all the people screaming and fighting about this issue or many more, who think they have like some really great understanding of it. Even the ones who do have a good understanding of it. Do you really know the full story? Yeah. Because every time there's some sort of big issue like this, let's, let's just, I'm, I, I don't want to sound like some crazy conspiracy, conspiracy theorist, but like there are rich people in boardrooms and in offices who are making decisions about things we don't understand. Oh yeah. I'll tell you this. The United States is not forking over billions to Israel because they love and worry about the Jewish people. If you think that, you're a fucking moron. Honest, you literally, if you think the U.S. really just like cares, they want to make sure Jews everywhere are safe. And that is why they unleash billions in aid or that they care for the Ukrainian people. Like they just... They see what's happening to the Ukrainian people and they think they don't deserve this. If that's what you think these things are about, it's like, let me know how Santa Claus is too. Let me, <laughs> let me, cause you are in fucking fantasy land, right? So the idea that we would like lose friendships, not talk to people again over these issues that fundamentally we cannot control or even have a full understanding of, it's just so depressing. Um, 
And it's just another reason why it's not worthwhile. Um, and that's not to say like, it's not worthwhile to care about issues that matter. It is. But I sometimes feel that like I was raised. I was raised to like believe that to pay attention to world news and politics and things that are going on is to be a smart, good person. Mm. And if you just like have fun and like when you're with your family, you just like play games and music and eat and drink. Like, I feel like my family kind of looks down at that. Mm. Like, it's like, no, what? We talk about things. We read the New Yorker and then we talk about issues and we argue about them. That's what smart people do. Dumb people have fun and eat and drink and dance. Now, I'm, it's never been said out loud, but it's sort of like how it feels to me. Mm. And as I've gotten older, I'm like, I mean, Natalie came to my house once and she made a joke to me like that, like when she like sat down, she was like, it's like, it's like turning on CNN. Like when I walk into your house, like from the second you sit down, it is just topic, 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 news, 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 this, that, argue, argue. And frankly, when I hang out with her family, and by the way, both of our families are flawed and great in different ways. But in terms of at least the hanging out part, her family it's generally like a lot of eating and there's pretty loud music playing. And like, there's not even a lot of conversation like music is on and kids are playing. And honestly, when I leave, I don't feel like we talked about very much. And like, that's kind of okay. Now I think it's nice for an immediate family to talk about issues around the table, right? Like I, I hope that when Natalie and I have kids, if we're blessed with children, I hope that we sit around the table and say, hey, let's talk about things that are happening in the world and give everyone some understanding and context and information. But I don't think you need to do that at like bigger family gatherings. Yeah. Like, I think that may be the time. I think maybe they're on to something with like this like dancing, yeah. drinking, having this, a good time. This Might brings be up something go. that I, I would actually love to get your input on because for a lot of these issues, you know, I'm very fortunate enough to be a white privilege man a lot a lot of the world's issues that have happened over the past few years don't directly affect me in any way and because of that i'm kind of like i'm in a weird space where i don't quite know what to do like i don't know what in the israel palestine and the black lives matter these things that don't directly affect me or my people my circle my community like i don't know what i'm supposed to do like as a jewish man and if I support the Jewish cause, like, what am I supposed to do about it? Am I supposed to post about it? Am I supposed to talk to people about it? Like, I, when there's these big things, I don't quite know what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to be super educated on everything? Or is it just like an ignorance is bliss kind of thing and just go about your life if it doesn't affect you? But then I think about, well, if I were in that position, I would want someone to care about my play as well. So it was like, it's such a, I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to, show support if I need to show support. I think it's, I, I, I can't speak for others, but I think it's just important to be, if you're a person of privilege, uh, you know, which we both are uh, to, to varying degrees. I think it's important to at least know what the plight is of other people. I think to not know about it and not pay any attention to it is to be a part of the problem. Mm. That I do think is a real thing, right? Like if you walk around, you know, like I know people in my life who are like, they didn't really believe in racism as a big problem because they're like, I didn't come from anything and I worked myself off of my bootstraps. If I can, why, why can't they? And it's like, well, if you don't understand that, like a poor white person and a poor black person in America are not on equal footing. If you don't understand that, and you're, you, you don't operate in a way where you understand that, then you're kind of furthering it. Mm. Like you kind of have to come at things like, I fundamentally, you know, still like believe in things like affirmative action because of that, you know? And a lot of times people misunderstand that. Yeah. And maybe I even misunderstand it. So let me not act like I'm educated. When I say it, what I mean is, all things are equal, dead equal. I am going with the person of color. 
be because of the history of this country. If we ever want to try to get to a place where things are actually equal, we, we, we will need to continue to give people opportunity who were denied opportunity for a very long time. I don't, I don't, I don't hate everyone who doesn't see it that way, but that that's how I, that to me, that would be like, and by the way, I have in my life, in terms of the people who I work with and help, I have plenty of white people and I have plenty of people of other ethnic backgrounds who I help or, you know, give work to whatever it may be. It's not like I'm like, you know, I meet a white kid who's wants to hustle work for me. My biggest assistant I had forever was a, a white Jewish kid um, or like half Jewish. Didn't really seem Jewish, but he was. Um, so like, I'm not saying that like, I'm not saying that I think race should govern over every decision we make. And like, you're really fond of someone. You're like, I'm not going to help you out. I'm sorry. You seem like a great white person. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But yeah. what I'm saying is if you do have a powerful job and you are interviewing two people who seem exactly equal on all levels, to me, you would be foolish to not understand that the poor black person has had an even harder time than the poor white person in America. It's baked into what the country is, right? So I'm just saying, I think having that understanding and being aware of that is important. And there are people who don't even have an aware awareness of that. Like they literally operate under the guise of like, get over it, man. Well, what do you mean? It's America. We're all the same. You're like, well, how can we all be the same? If, if one person's grandparents were literally denied basic human rights and yours were not, how do you think you could be at the same place right now? You think the race only starts like when you feel like it does? Like I, that, that, that's a ridiculous idea to me. Like, well, we were both born on the same day. Well, yeah, but your parents weren't and your parents didn't look the same. All of those things matter. I was only able to pursue my career because my parents were well to do enough that I didn't have to go get some, you know, really like not fun, not culturally exciting job in high school because I needed to put money on the table at my house. No, my parents paid for me to go to college and I was an intern and then they were paying for all of my college. So like, I just did my little radio job where I got paid $5 an hour to be a board op because I wasn't really doing it for money. I was just doing it to do it. Like then after college, I was just like DJing and hustling or doing whatever. Granted, I never got money from my parents after college and I never went home again, but I knew the whole time I could have. And that's a big deal that allowed me to be a freelance DJ and board op and part-time radio host and all these low paying jobs I was able to do because my parents were able to not face any discrimination in a real way and earn a living in America. So yeah, my parents were, my grandparents were immigrants. Sure. But when they got to America, they were still white. You know, they spoke broken English. They were white. They got jobs in a factory. And then they had kids here who were also Jewish, but presented white and could get a job as they did. You know, every, it was all relatively easy. So we, we, we can't act as if every story is equal. So I think it's important to your, uh, to your question, you know, that, you know, if, if you're someone who's basically your, your lineage goes back to the fucking Mayflower, it's just important to know that not everybody's does. And I think to pay attention to what those people's stories are, even if you're not posting about it and talking about it, just understanding it and being able to explain it to your loved ones and your family and maybe help out when you can. To me, that is ultimately what being an ally is more so than posting something on Instagram. Well, Peter, I had many other things that I want to get into. With I think you I've today. been incredible. Have I been, I think I've been incredibly long winded. No, that's totally okay. Um, I, I've appreciated all the thought and depth. Um, I could tell it's been a bit cathartic to you. So I'm, I'm glad that we've had to have this conversation. Um, if you had, do you have one more thing, you know, you want to ask that would, you, you I, feel I will, I will just, it's all like completely different and that doesn't seem appropriate at this point. So we have but to do another, but, another one. You want to do another yeah, one sometime? We have to do another one. I mean, we'll be in person at WrestleMania just saying. Maybe, maybe a little can, uh, hang at the hotel room. Maybe, maybe a little hotel hang. Get, get yeah, you know, because you know, working in the background. Because, you know, of all the time, of all the weekends when I'm just like, I got free time coming right. out of my ears. It's WrestleMania yeah, weekend. For, for sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be doing hosting for WWE, our podcast. Plus, I think I'm going to do other. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. We'll sit down yeah, and have yeah. a life. 
We'd squeeze it. But squeeze no, we again. can do another, regardless, we can do another one where we can get into the more. Cause yeah, yeah, I talk I, about, I want to talk about like your hustling and your backstory. Cause I still don't know too much about your backstory, like in your twenties and whatnot, but I'm glad that we've had this conversation because in the name of my own self-improvement, these are conversations that I do not often have. This has gotten me out of my comfort zone. So that this, this uh, works into my self-improvement window. My last question okay. will be if you were dictator of the United States for a day, let's say we have a dictator. Some would argue we, we've, we've had that. Some, in recent, some would argue we're facing that again <laughs> yes. in recent years. If there was one action you could compel every citizen of the United States to take, mandatory, what would it be? A mandatory action that yes, everyone a, has to take. An action, a behavioral change, a um, a hobby, just anything. Any, so essentially, like, what is the change that you wish to see in the world and how would you... And in what way would you try to get people to embody that change? Oh, man. I mean, I, I've had, I've had some thoughts before, like, um, you know, if you get busted drunk driving, mandatory jail time, no, no trial. Like literally you blow, you're over. It's 60 days in jail. That's it. There's no, there's just what it is. There's no, because I think that's the only way that it seems you could stop this problem. Cause at this point there seems like there's no reason for it. Yeah. In the, in the Uber era, it's like, what, why were you blackout drunk and driving? But like, if everybody knew, like I literally don't want to go immediate, like I, they'll pull you over, you blow. It hits that number and they go, well, here you go. Uh, well, you can call your family when you get to the, when you get to jail. I think that would actually make an impact. I would like to see something for texting and driving too. In that vein, I mean, it's so it's kind of like with the phones in school. I remember like when I was growing up and, and we had phones. They're like no phones in school, and you talk and like it was largely effective. But now since you know phones have just become so intertwined with our lives, schools have just given up. Like the kids were using them too much. No it overweighed the policy because you couldn't police it. Same kind of with texting and driving. Now it is so commonplace and the people just haven't listened at all. It's kind of like just not enforced that much anymore. And it's just as dangerous. I just as dangerous. I mean, you, I could argue it's worse. Yeah. Cause you, cause there are people who drink and drive and even though it's fucked up, they're at least trying their hardest and like concentrating. They really focus. Yeah. Cause like they, they know like, they're doing the wrong. <laughs> right. Like that, that, that does exist. Um, yeah. whereas texting and driving, that's kind of impossible. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe it would just be an immediate, like, uh, phones get like the cigarette treatment. Like you cannot use them till you're 18. Hmm. You know, no such thing as a, no, yeah, maybe that's what I'm going with is the is the first real serious phone law treating these things like the poison that they are and being like you it's for adults. And if you want a phone as you're if you're a kid and you want a phone, you get a flip phone where you can send a text message and you can answer a phone call. And if parents give their kids and, and it's known that your kids are openly using a a, a a smartphone the parents have like are legitimately in trouble that that might be because i just worry about what the future is i yeah. just i think there is a world in which we get to a point where people do look at phones as cigarettes like dude do you used to let kids play with phones right because i this, mean i, I have no data to support this but I feel like you can make the argument that the psychological damage done to a 14 year old with the phone is worse out outweighs the physical damage of, of a cigarette for a 14 year old. Oh, there's no way to back that up, but it's so true. Yeah, it's so true. And, and we look at people who smoke cigarettes as like fucking sick deviants. <laughs> <Right>. now. <laughs> and, and yet this people are just like, and you're fine. Everyone's right. fine. I mean, it's, it's, we carry virtual cigarette packs everywhere we go. Yeah, this is, but again, to your point, it's like there are people who like use, who smoke a pack a day their whole life and they just turn out fine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone can obsessively use their phone and turn out fine. I don't, I don't know if that's possible. So yeah, I, I think it would be some sort of phone law. I like it. 
I, I would I would co-sign on that. Uh, Peter Rosenberg, the I'm going to mess this up and I'm going to miss something. The host of Cheap Heat. Yeah. Co-host of Over the Top. The host, uh, co-host of the morning show on Hot 97. What is it? The Ebro show? You know, Ebro in the morning or Ebro, Ebro in the morning. Rosenberg, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Uh, there's this real late show, which I didn't know you were still doing. I think you do that on Sundays. Sunday you nights. Yeah. Midnight WWE to kickoff shows for the, yes. the WWE PLEs. You're yep. a co-host of the Michael K show. Yep. I think um, you hit- what am I missing? <laughs> I think you, you may DJ have, weddings too. And every whatnot. once in a while I'll get out and do a gig, but I think you basically hit it all, man. Good <sighs> well, job. I'm, dude. I'm, I'm, tired, I'm tired. Just thinking about it. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for joining me. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, getting to work with you past couple years. And I look you forward too, to buddy. doing it more. Thank you. Me too. I hope I didn't bore your audience.